잠시 후 곧바로 세 번째 세션이 시작될 예정입니다. 참석자 여러분들께서는 입장을 하셔서 자리에 착석해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 그럼 지금부터 아시아 리더십 컨퍼런스 트랙 3의 세 번째 세션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin our third session under the title Korea Holds the Key to Global Recycling Economy. And allow me to introduce our great speakers today. We have Han Hwa Jin, Minister of Environment of Republic of Korea, and Frode Solberg, Norwegian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Dominic Hogg, former chairman and founder of Unomia Research and Consulting, Shiram Ramakrishna, senior professor and circular economy task force chair at the National University of Singapore. And last but not least, Sarah Son, real partner in South Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them with a warm round of applause. 네, 뜨거운 박수로 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 먼저 기조 연설이 있겠습니다. And now, Han Hwa Jin, Minister of Environment of Republic of Korea, will deliver her keynote speech. And due to the schedule, Minister Han must leave right after the speech. So, please welcome her with a warm round of applause. 모두 뜨거운 박수로 장관님 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 여러분 반갑습니다. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Han Hwa Jin. I'm the Minister of Environment of the Republic of Korea. First of all, I think it is very meaningful that I am gathered with the experts from the different countries in the world to discuss uh, a solution to achieving a circular economy. We can talk about the circular economy policies and blueprint of Korea amid the climate change. I believe that uh, carbon use is a matter of survival, it's not a matter of choice for us. And the current climate crisis originates from the legacy of the era of industrialization. Mass production, mass consumption, mass disposal uh, uh, happens in a linear economy and uh, it creates a massive amount of uh, carbon emissions uh, by maximizing the use of resources and energy. So make a transition to a circular economy that breaks uh, away from the linear economy is the most clear solution for us to adopt in this era of having to respond to the crisis of resources and energy. A circular economy is about trying to restore the utility of resources that are being discarded unnecessarily in all phases of production, consumption, and disposal. So to make our industrial competitiveness and resource efficiency, our steps towards achieving this circular economy is garnering pace. As of March 2020, the EU has and now the new circular economy action plan and they have mandated, mandated the use of plastic uh, recyclable materials in the production of plastic packing materials and at the same time last uh, March at the UN uh, Environmental Assembly by 2024 they agreed uh, to create uh, a plastic agreement uh, to counter to the environmental pollution problem of the world and the UN government that was launched last May uh, has uh, identified the completion of a circular economy as one of its national tasks and it is seeking to introduce various policies to make it a success. For the production step, by 2030, we plan to utilize recycled material 30% for all PET bottles, and we will strive and plan so that the products in their design phase can be made in a way that it is easier to recycle, and to this end, we will be providing incentives to producers. In consumption and in the distribution, unnecessary packaging will be reduced, and we will also 
strengthen policies to uh, reduce disposable goods, uses of disposable goods. Also, high quality recycling will be possible through AI robots and other selection systems in recycling. We will also be using gas technology, biogas technology, and thermal decomposition technology in order to increase the portion of plastic and um, plastic materials being used as fuel. Right now, the percentage is only 1%, but it will be expanded to 10% by 2026. And these policies will be uh, carried out through laws. And uh, to this end, we will strive to establish the Circular Economy Society Transition Promotion Act. Korea seeks to uh, exchange and share its policies and cases for a circular economy. And we will also participate in various activities to find uh, pool our wisdom to realize this. And we hope that through your insights and discussions, we can realize transition and find the key to a circular economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Han, thank you. 네, 다시 한번 말씀 감사드립니다. 그 정관님은 일정 관계로 먼저 자리를 네, uh, 주시게 됐습니다. 양해 말씀드립니다. So now I would like right to now. introduce our great Please moderator for this session. Ms. Megan C, Director of Partnership at Echo Business, will moderate this session. Please welcome Ms. Megan C with a warm round of applause. 네, 모두 뜨거운 박수로 저희 좌장을 숙, 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here and a very warm welcome to everyone who's here in the audience today at the Sheila Soul and also for all of you who have joined virtually as well. You have joined the Asian Leadership Conference Dialogue Session, New Voyage for Circular Economy, the Disposable Cup Deposit System. I'm Megan C, Director of Partnerships at EcoBusiness, Asia Pacific's leading media and business intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development and responsible business. I am extremely honored to be here today with our distinguished panel of speakers who I will introduce in just a couple of moments. The circular, the circular economy has been in a spotlight in global policy debates, not only because of its potential for the economy, but also as key in the fight against climate change. According to the Center for Environmental Law, emissions from plastic production and incineration could amount to 56 billion tons of carbon between now and 2050, while research conducted by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation showed that by applying a circular economy through designing out waste, keeping materials in use, and regenerating natural resources, we can reduce re emissions by about 9.3 billion tons. With this, it is heartening to see that countries are making efforts to achieve a circular economy to solve the climate crisis and other environmental problems as well. The EU and OECD, as well as governments around the world, have already implement implemented some form of disposable device system to innovate resource circulation, with EU single-use plastics directive mandating member states to collect 90% of all plastic beverage containers by 2029. From December 2nd, Korea is expected to implement the disposable cup deposit system for the first time in the world. However, in Korea, the importance and necessity of the empty container deposit system called the deposit return system, DRS for short, is not well known, and there's much room to improve in implementing this system. What then can Korea learn from other countries that have, that have successfully implemented the DRS? What are the challenges in implementing a well-functioning DRS? What are the forces at play in ensuring success of the system? And do regional or global alignment matter? I certainly do not have the answers here today, but together with my very esteemed panel of speakers, we hope to shed some light on these key issues. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our panel speakers for this session. We have Ambassador Frode Sobok here, Norwegian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Ambassador Frode has had experience in many positions, both in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also in Norwegian embassies abroad, including Minister and Deputy Head of Mission in Stockholm, Consulate at Norwegian Embassy in Berlin, just to name a few. We have Professor Sivir Ramakrishna, Circular Economy Task Force Chair, Director Centre for Nanotechnology and Sustainability of the National University of Singapore, and also a world-renowned researcher at the National University of Singapore and Circular Economy Task Force Economy Activist and also co-owner of award-winning book and introduction to Circular Economy. 
We are Sarah San here, we look partner of South Korea, where she leads Zero Waste Home, an online community with more than 17,000 members across the country, focusing on reducing waste and pollution. And last but not least, joining us virtually all the way from the UK, Dominic Hogg, former chairman and founder of Eunomia Research and Consulting, a leading international environmental research company established in 2001. With that, I'd like to pose this first question to all my distinguished speakers here. The first question, I'm going to go according to this order, Ambassador Frog, um, Pro Serum, Sarah, and last, last but not least, Dominic there. So the first question here, the mandatory deposit return system, or DRS, in Korea has been pushed back by six months to December. Seeing that we have all of you come from various backgrounds and countries, from your experience, how can DRS achieve success from the start? I'm going to go to Ambassador Ford first. Thank you very much, Megan, and thank you for inviting uh, me to this uh, distinguished panel with such uh, distinguished experts. Uh, that's really, uh, an, uh, really an honor. And I think would also like to, to thank uh, the Chosen Ilbo to, to uh, invite to such an important topic, because this is truly something we need to, to discuss. Um, let me also uh, thank uh, Minister Hahn for her remarks um, at the outset of this session because there were many important things said there with the strong ambitions from the Korean side uh, that I think is very important for Korea but also for uh, the global society. Uh, she mentioned quite a few important keywords uh, with regard to both numbers but also uh, I noticed that uh, she talked about design which I think is also to, to remember as part of the circular economy where we have experts that know far more than me about this but to think this is not only about uh, treating waste but also in the design process. Um, I come from a country who had uh, a strong and long-standing experience on deposit return systems and today uh, plastic bottles and bot um, bottles and, and containers with, uh, with deposit, we have more than 90% return rate. Um, so we do have a strong experience. And maybe to mention some keywords that I think could be useful uh, in the introduction and in the, as the system now is being set up in, in Korea. Um, I think the importance of having a complete and robust system. Uh, and that's why I think that time not necessarily. Time is important. We need to change. Uh, all of us need to change. And time is, of course, a, a very important factor. But even more important is to have a robust and uh, good system in place so you can have both producer and consumer confidence when the system is in place. So if it goes too fast and that isn't good enough, uh, that might you might be uh, going in the wrong direction already from the start. Um, as part of that, you need uh, to have policies, you need to have regulations in place uh, from, uh, from the authority side. So producers and consumers know what they have to deal with. I think that's, that's also very important. Um, you also, both the minister and you mentioned cooperation. I think cooperation to have common standards uh, and might also uh, present this here and mention that here to, to learn from countries with long-standing experience. I think that we, we're always ready to share our insight, and I think that's important in order to make the system work from an early start. Um, and also from, if I mention one last thing, to have um, consumer loyalty, to try to use information, to use ads, to try to change people, and, and inform people that this is the way we have to do it. This is how we can engage in a circular economy. This is how we can go in a green direction. We have to create loyalty to the system and also to make it, I think part of the success story in Norway was that we create an atmosphere where it's, it's not decent to pollute. The right thing to do is to bring back stuff. You need the system, of course, but you also need to create uh, uh, a sense of loyalty and a sense of, of decency in how we deal with both the things we use, but also with nature. So I think that's, that's part of the solution as well. Thank you, Ambassador Broad and for Prof. Serum. Thank you, Megan, for having me on the panel, as well as the organizers. I'd like to begin by appreciating South Korea providing leadership in the area of climate goals. 
I was talking to the Minister Han just before this session. Uh, she reiterated that South Korea committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. To achieve that kind of carbon neutrality, it has to be linked to the circular economy. We know 20% of the global emissions are related to the materials and circular economy. And title of this particular panel session, Korea holds the key to the global recycling economy. I think it's very well said, and absolutely I believe that. And I also add a word, it is not only holding the key, it's also a responsibility. So I add Singapore along with the South Korea, that we have the responsibility to enable global recycling economy. Now the question would be to make this global recycling economy necessary for reducing the carbon emissions, also lowering the social costs on the people due to the solid waste accumulation on the planet, it need to come along with the extended producer responsibility scheme, which I believe South Korea, Singapore, as well as many other countries, like the ambassador mentioned, Norway, are leading in enacting EPR laws in their own country. So along with the EPR, an associated policy implementation is deposit refund scheme, DRS. And different places, they use different titles. For example, in Singapore, we call BCRS, Beverage Container Return Scheme. So the whole concept is to enable recycling industry and manage it very well so that it becomes an example for sound management of the waste. So in other words, we are reducing the social costs and keeping the planet safe and healthy for the current generation as well as the future generation. So, Megan, you asked the question, how DRS should be linked to the cup um, consideration? Obviously, South Korea with a population of 51 plus million, that means uh, it's uh, <coughs> 10 times bigger than Singapore. And as I said, with a responsibility in place, and also with a focus that South Korea would like to lead in this particular area, so DRS applying to uh, take back scheme for cups would be a good starting point. I just want to end with a small, uh, my own observation, personal observation. I had been visiting uh, South Korea for many years. I have seen myself how South Korea built a most critical technology solution, what we call nuclear energy. So you have built nuclear energy capacity, which is almost 20% uh, of the national energy mix, so, which is a very complex technology. And you also build a very strong industry base over the years. So obviously I believe South Korea, as the title says, holds the key to the global recycling economy because you can develop the necessary industry, infrastructure, um, provide the solution not only for South Korea, but as well as the large Asian countries, where which is projected to produce a lot more uh, solid waste, you know, all, along with the economic growth, which is projected to happen as we go into the next uh, 10, 20 years. So in nutshell, in short, having a, a deeper and a faster action and having a DRS implementation with all its challenges, it is a way of uh, South Korea demonstrating on the world stage that they have a solution, they solve the problems, and others can emulate. With that, I think we'll make the place a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Zero. That was very enlightening. Um, and for Sarah, what do you think about that? First of all, it's a great it's a great honor to be here, and thank you for inviting me. But um, because of the time limitation and my speech for the later questions are a little bit duplicated, so I'll skip my answer here. Um, but let me introduce myself. Uh, three About three years ago, I have conducted a Docu TV documentary film titled Circular Economy Waste His Resources. That's how I got involved in this field. And um, I'll talk 
more about these issues later. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We look forward to hearing from you later on. Um, and for Dominic, last but not least, um, how can DRS achieve success from this start from your experience? Thanks, Megan. And thanks for inviting me. And it's a great honor to be here. Um, apologies, I can't or be. <laughs> already muted you. I haven't. Uh, uh, yeah, now you're on. You're good. OK. Um, thank you, Megan. And thanks uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be with you, if not in person. Um, I had a, a joyful waking up with a cold shower at three o'clock in the morning today, and um, I'm uh, very pleased, though, to, to speak to you today. Uh, personally, I've been involved in a number of deposit refund schemes, evaluating them and helping them to, to be implemented and trying to understand the economics of the system and how they should operate, uh, both in Europe, but also in North America. and um, I think what's interesting with what South Korea is doing here is it's doing something really quite unique. It's um, a deposit refund si system for cups. And I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world that's actually doing this. So everybody, I think, will be watching uh, with interest at what happens in South Korea. And um, you mentioned about what we could, what could be learned from other countries. Um, and I think part of the question was about holding back for six months in the implementation here. Well, I can tell you that in my own country, implementation has been very slow indeed, which is, has been a great disappointment uh, to us. And so if I had to convey one important lesson, it would be much as I think Ambassador Froda was saying, that uh, it's key to maintain the commitment and the ambition to carry forward with these uh, schemes, but equally, to make sure they are well designed because the design of the policy and the scheme itself will influence how well it's accepted by both the businesses and the consumers. And uh, it's in everyone's interest, I think, that a scheme like this is, is, uh, has every chance to succeed and to be successful in a, as an efficient way as possible so that the cost to businesses and to consumers are, uh, are kept as, as low as they can be consistent with achieving uh, the very positive objectives that I think that the scheme has. So in summary, I think uh, it's really important to, to get those policy questions right and, to, um, and not to have them watered down. I, I'm concerned that in my own country, we're seeing some watering down of policy commitments as time moves, moves on with these uh, delays. So um, I, I applaud your ambition. And uh, I'm very interested to see, as I say, um, how things move forward in the in the future. Thank you, Dominic, for that. Um, I wanted to go to Ambassador Frode. I know earlier you said about how important it was to share experiences. So turning to Norway, um, you know, Norway has been a long-time supporter of the DRS. Um, it has been operating the system for a very long time, and the current rate of overall beverage packaging is more than 90% right now. So what were the most, the most important factors that led to Norway being ahead of the curve on DRS? Well, um, I, can, I, I don't know whether I will dare to say what was the most important factors, but some of the, the key factors, I, can, I think it's a combination of carrot and stick. Like, that's, you need to change culture, you need to change behavior. But in order to change behavior, you need some, normally, we're all resisting change. So we need some incentives to, to try to do that. And I think it was based on um, economic incentives, both towards producers and consumers. First, to the producers to, um, to establish systems that would be uh, viable and economic possible to introduce in order to have a large return uh, rate. Um, and then there was a deposit system that we've had for many, many years uh, to um, invite consumers to deliver back uh, all containers or major plastic and glass containers. And as there's an economic benefit in, in doing that. Uh, but it has to be easy and accessible. And I think that's why we um, also have a strong industry sort of developing systems for that for a long time as well. 
but the there is there is um, uh, that's those are maybe the, the carrots. But there's a stick as well. So we've introduced two taxation systems. One is an environmental tax uh, that is uh, placed on the the producers, and there's a flat return tax as well uh, of about well it, it differs a little bit, but where you get your your tax back because it's put on the container. But as in all return schemes, you get it back when you deliver it back. So you have a take back system. Uh, the environmental tax is designed in a way that the higher the return rate, the lower the tax is for the producer. So it incentivizes uh, the to make it make the systems easy, to make it accessible, easy to use for the consumers. And with a high return rate, the tax goes down. So it's, it's in a way a very positive, if you have a take back of more than 95%, you don't pay tax at all. And then it's based uh, percent by percent. So if you have 89% return, well, you pay 11% tax. So it's a very, very, in my way, well-designed system to, to make it uh, positive for the producers to uh, design the systems as well. So I think um, that is, is some of the important issues. And then back to also to have uh, a robust system, as I mentioned in my, my previous intervention. Um, but, but to have a combination of carrots and sticks, um, that's normally what we need to, uh, to in order to change behavior. And it's been a very successful one in our case. Thank you, Ambassador Frode. Uh, Prof Sirum, I actually wanted to turn to you because it seemed that you had something to say to that. Yes, I certainly have uh, something to say. I'll start by saying I'm jealous about the <laughs> Excellency Ambassador from Norway, uh, Ambassador Frode, because it's a dream to achieve such a high levels of um, recycling rates. So I think that's what exactly most countries should emulate. So your question is uh, what should be done or what should be in place? There are a few aspects. Uh, even though we think uh, recycling is simple, but when it comes to the common person, it's very complicated. They do not really understand. So there's a lot more uh, information, education, as well as uh, informing all the stakeholders, in this case, uh, civil society, in this case, uh, business community or industry community, as well as the policy makers. We need a lot more education on all the three friends. Second aspect is uh, the societies have changed quite a bit. So we play a huge importance, knowing that unknowingly for convenience, so we had to make these um, written back schemes uh, easily accessible and convenient. And that's essentially need to be there so that uh, we can increase the, uh, our recycling rates and also ensuring the success of the DRS scheme. Uh, if you, I know, Megan, you know, Professor, don't give a long-winded answer. Uh, we are not students. Uh, we are uh, serious uh, professionals. Short answer, if I had to condense it and say in one line, Set a national target on a very high recycling rates. Just the way we had done, say, carbon neutrality by 2050, most countries, most industries still do not know exactly how to go about, but that provides them the momentum and also impetus. So essentially, a short ways, uh, countries could set uh, higher recycling rates, ambitious goals, specific uh, timeline target, that would enable them to push it through so that everything else would fall in line. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Serum. Um, sir, I wanted to turn to you, to you um, on whether you had any thoughts on the carrot and stick approach here in, or in Korea, but also in terms of the DRS implementation as well. Um, there really seems to be two elements at play here, which is government will and business buy-in. So in South Korea's case, what are the businesses' interests and in politics at play really that has led to this point? Um, and you know, I think we know that cost might be seen as a, um, a major concern here. Um, for example, the barcode sticker, um, the credit cost transactions cost as well but really how legitimate is this concern? Just prior to the announced suspension, the government had been communicating with franchise headquarters. However, most stores are not headquarters, but rather franchisees owned by individuals. In addition to royalties, headquarters make profits by selling products to franchisees, such as coffee beans, food ingredients, and even cups. 
So the position of the franchise headquarters and the store owners may be quite different. Since individual business owners were excluded from the conversation, the police details were struck against them, it seems the government assumed that headquarters would take responsibility for franchisees, but that didn't happen. As the implementation date of the system approached, complaints arose from small business owners. And the costs are always a major concern, but there have been several misunderstandings. Many cafe owners do agree that they're responsible for using a large number of single-use cups and say they can bear the cost if it's reasonable. But the most, imp the most important matter is that the workforce was overlooked. The issue is not the cost of the sticker, but the cost of the labor behind the sticker. The largest portion of the system's cost is the labor of manually collecting the cups. Thank you, Sarah, for that. And then sticking on to the cost of, of this system, I wanted to move to Dominic. Um, you know, in terms of the economics of this system, really how should this be worked out um, for a successful DRS, especially given the state of the F&B or the hospitality sectors right now, um, you know, with the fragility around COVID-19 pandemic and, and also the inflationary costs too? Thanks, and uh, I, I enjoyed Sarah's comment there. I think... Um, Bearing in mind, again, that this is a novel scheme in terms of applying a deposit to cups, and there are, there are likely to be some similarities or potential similarities and some differences in how we look at cups relative to beverage containers. But I think it was up, if it was up to me, I'd be uh, interested to try to make the system self-financing so it's not actually dipping into government funds. And so ultimately, um, uh, the businesses and consumers uh, will will be expected to pay. Uh, that means, though, that you've got to have these revenue streams from the scheme broadly in balance with the costs. And Sarah hinted there at some of the costs that the businesses will face. And I think one of the most important things will be for those businesses, well, how are they um, recompensed for the role they play in the system? And that becomes slightly more complicated in the case of businesses who are franchisees to large, larger businesses. So just by way of example, what would happen if one store took back twice as many cups as it actually sold? How would it actually be uh, recompensed through the system for actually doing that? And I think the other, the other issue further down the line is how will the system actually ensure there's an efficient logistics for the collection of the cups post uh, take back and to make sure that maximum value is generated from the materials once they are returned by the consumer. Because if you have a really pure stream of PET that's come back through a deposit refund system, then as Ambassador Frodo will tell you that in Norway has a much higher value than the, the material that's collected in the general recycling streams because it's such high quality. And that ought to make it better for the cup manufacturers to be integrating into recycled content in, in the cups that they're selling, which as uh, Minister Hahn uh, said earlier, there was a target for including recycled PET within bottles. Well, why not cups? So, um, so I think that uh, I'm, I'm slightly interested at the moment that the scheme seems to be leaving the decisions around collection recycling to the store owners. And I think there could be something much better uh, and more efficient done to make sure that those logistics are efficient and that the scheme benefits from the revenue from the sale of the materials, which if they're being collected in a deposit scheme should be very homogeneous and good for recycling as long as those cups have been designed in such a way as they are recyclable. But can I finish with one point that Ambassador Froda made about the, the, the use of the, the carrot and the stick? And I'd like to think that, is, that one evolution of the system might be that, as Professor Siren was saying, we're, we're sort of addicted to convenience and we want our single-use cups. Well, surely we ought to use, be shifting more to refillables. So can we actually start to tax the single-use cups in the future? 
and actually have a deposit return system that's more based around refillables. And so we're actually minimizing the use of resources as we're consuming our coffee. If I was a coffee, I wouldn't want to spend my life on this planet <laughs> just being used to transport one person's coffee for a few seconds and then being discarded into the waste stream. I would like to think I was more useful than that. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I want to go to um, Prof. Serum on this point. Um, still on the point of you know, economics and cost as well. We know that Singapore is quite a business-friendly environment. Um, so how should our governments really go about alleviating this burden of expenses? Thank you, Megan. You, you're absolutely right that uh, we are also equally fortunate like Norway, where we have a good, good partnership among the civil society, industry, and the government which has produced a number of good results on many areas. Now, when it comes to circular economy, DRS scheme, uh, we believe that um, it has to be industry-led or a business-led scheme so that, as Dominic just now mentioned, uh, Sarah as well, that it is self-sustaining a model so that it doesn't rely too heavily with the government uh, interventions. So the direction is to go towards that one. So we started this uh, discussion exactly like South Korea. Uh, we have just completed uh, four rounds of consultation with industry. And by end of the year, uh, there would be a clear plan that would be made. But it's already uh, made known that uh, this would be industry-led way of operating a system. So I think uh, that would be the most uh, reasonable way to go. So if I take a simple uh, poll among all our panelists, I'm sure Dominic already said that should be business-led. I'm sure other two panelists as well might think the same way. I do believe um, that provides more clarity. It also creates a more innovation uh, if it is uh, with a clear oversight from the regulators, but it's actually led by the business or uh, industry leaders. Thank you, Prof. Serum. Um, Ambassador Fro, feel free to comment on that as well. But I wanted to go a step further um, and talk about the ban of single-use plastics. Uh, we know that in Norway, um, it's already banned single-use plastics, um, and UK as well is countering at that sing a ban on single-use plastics as well. So what can countries like South Korea and Singapore um, learn from your respective countries' journey in banning that single-use plastic products? And really, you know, what is the most essential national-level initiative that must be implemented by governments to effectively carry out this single-use plastic ban? Uh, well, that's a tough one, um, but I think um, any initiative uh, could be important because, I mean, the, the, the plastic pollution is one of the major uh, environmental challenges we are facing. Uh, we find now plastic everywhere on the globe. Um, Norway being in uh, a country located far north, uh, we have seen how plastic is now found in the most remote ice and sea areas up in the Arctic areas. We see it down in the Antarctic. It's, it's everywhere. So we need, we need to do something about this. And what, what we can do, I think, um, uh, ambitions like uh, Minister Han, like my, my dear panelists are saying here, to have strong ambitions, um, that, that's a very important part in itself. And, and maybe to set those ambitions at a level uh, where we might not be able to see the, every single response yet, but that is something to strive for in the future. I think that's, that's important. Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm not going to mention all the issues and all the problems we face with plastic, but perhaps focusing on um, uh, some of the things that we have. We have used policies to ban, as you said, uh, Megan, to use, to ban plastic, single-use single, uh, single -use plastic, to maybe as a couple of, of initiatives to, to the Republic of Korea. I think the ambitions and what, what Korea is doing now can really be a beacon of hope in this area. And I think that, that's important as so well, that we, that we motivate and engage uh, ourselves together in, in order to set these ambitions like Korea is and Singapore is doing now. Um, the return system is one very, very important thing because without a return system, we will not be able to, to, re, to reduce it. But I think Minister Han also mentioned one additional thing that I, I think that I noticed coming from Norway, and that is the use of plastic. Uh, plastic wrapping uh, that we, each and every one, 
that both producers and consumers are more um, active in thinking how can we reduce plastic wrapping everywhere. I mean, we all face that several times a day that you buy a plastic container that contains even smaller things with plastic uh, wrapping around them. So it's used over and over um, again. So both uh, reduction and return schemes. But as I always say when we talk about environment, we have a tendency, all of us, to look to companies, to look to authorities, to governments, to guide us. Well, that's their job to guide us. But when to change, we have to start with ourselves. So it's up to each and every us, one of us to demand less use of plastic, to not buy the plastic bag, to bring stuff. We have to change behavior. And by changing behavior, we can change society as well. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Fro. Uh, I know we have about 10 minutes left, so I really wanted to go into our final two questions here. We've heard from, you know, uh, from, from our regional and global perspectives really on DRS implementation from all of our esteemed speakers here. Um, in terms of the regional global alignment question, how can this be done? And if so, how, how can it be implemented so that it's actually effective across the board? I'm going to start with Dominic and then I'll go down the line. Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, I, I'm not sure about the need for alignment in every point of detail here, but I think alignment in terms of uh, ambition is really important. And, um, and I also think that where beverage containers are concerned, for example, I think we have a template for successful schemes and there is a tendency for states, new jurisdictions, to want to redesign their own system, even when they're really excellent templates, ready to be used, um, adapted possibly to the, the national or local circumstances. But we sort of know what works. There'll be lots of countries watching South Korea with interest as it goes forward with this initiative, I think. Um, but I think that going back to my uh, previous point, I think there might be a future where single-use cups are really being targeted by policies such as taxes and where we have a, a DRS that's pushing more towards refillables for the use of um, uh, for, to encouraging people to use refillables or bring their own cup um, to uh, have their coffee. Um, so I think regional alignment in terms of ambition more, um, we have some issues in the EU at borders, but um, you know, I think we're always going to have them in terms of the level of a deposit, for example, between uh, different parts of the EU. Um, it would be nice to see harmonization, but my personal experience is that jurisdictions are too keen to design, design their own law. Thank you for that, Dominic. And Sarah, I'd like to go to, to you on this question as well. Maybe Prof. Serum, we can go then. Thank you. I, I like to say that um, it's very important to have alignment, but I use the word instead of alignment, probably harmonization. Uh, the reason is uh, in Asia, no single country has a full supply chain. If you are looking at from the resin all the way to the usage and post years waste management, there are several steps involved, there are several players, several industry. And with a good harmonization, uh, there is interoperability will be better. Uh, second, there is also less chance for fraud. Third is more convenience. I'll give an example. Singapore is very close to Malaysia and Indonesia. People actually go in the weekend, almost a half a million people. They go and buy things and come home. So when they buy and bring, essentially they're bringing all the containers, packaging. So a simple harmonization would go a long way for the convenience of the people. That actually makes them to subscribe to the whole process. Then actually it builds up the higher recycling, which is what we desire as a humanity. So my sense is uh, however hard or difficult it is, uh, some level of harmonization is good. Again, uh, I like to say that uh, there are enough examples in the world where su such harmonization reduce the costs, increase the efficiencies. Uh, more importantly, there would be more uh, acceptance by the people. Thank you, Prof. Sirman. 
Ambassador Fro, please. Well, I don't think I have much to add. I think Sir Ram and Dominic has, has mentioned very important uh, factors, but I think also a certain degree of, of cooperation. I, I, I always, it's my job, of course, to underline the importance of the international cooperation, and, uh, but I, th I truly think that is important. It makes it easier for all of us as consumers, but it also makes it easier, as Ram said, uh, for, for companies to provide and to produce and design systems that can cater for a broader um, uh, specter of, of containers. And we have the same problem in uh, or the challenge I should say in in my country where many people you know they travel across borders Sweden Norway other countries in Europe and buy containers when you put them in the deposit um, uh, machine you will not be you can get the same amount or that that used to be a problem because even though they look the same there are certain specifics so I think if we can harmonize uh, even better, that will make it easier also for the, uh, our excellent businesses to provide systems that can cover a broader, uh, broader types of containers. Thank you, Ambassador Frode. I'm going to go on to the last question because we have five minutes left. So this is a challenge for everyone because I want to keep your answers to one minute at the maximum. Um, so there's now about five months until the commencement of the IRS in South Korea. If there's one absolutely critical thing that needs to be done right now to ensure a high rate of success, what would that be? I'm going to go on to Sarah first. Can I have a couple more minutes? Because oh, yeah, I, of course. Yeah, 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 of course. Prof. Serum seems all ready, so we're going to go to him now. <laughs> I would say it's communication. The past return system requires consumers to change their behavior, yet most consumers have not heard of single-use cup deposit system until the media became noisy over the delay of the system. The ultimate goal of the current single-use cup deposit system is a transition to a reusable cup deposit system, but municipalities are making great large and small attempts to create reusable cup deposit system in their region. If municipalities know that they will have to change their software, devices, and cups in near future, they might find present investment unwise. Whether it's one way or reusable, deposit return system should be applied universally. Now, even some brands are trying to implement their own deposit system. From December, the number one brand in coffee will operate a reusable cup deposit system in Seoul. This may make them look good in some people's eyes. However, it also means that from December, they are freed from the duty to collect single-use cup, coinciding with the period during which the system's implementation was delayed. They brought the single-use cup takeaway culture to Korea. It's hard to say whether this is a coincidence or not, but one thing is certain. When the government tries to convert the current system to a reusable cup system in three years or so, they will already operate their own reusable cup system throughout the country. It will be a barrier to a transition to a universal reusable cup deposit system. They may even try to influence the system to their advantage. In a democratic country, the government may not be able to institutionally prevent individual deposit system from operating, but it may defer such behavior by ensuring consumers are aware of the facts, as brands are most concerned with how consumers think about them. Thank you, Sarah and Prof. Zero. Okay, so my sense is um, leaders has to be more ambitious. When I say leaders, I mean government leaders or political leaders.